Hi, I'm Lyndon Hosking and welcome to Boxing Deep Dive, where we take all sorts of boxing topics and subjects and discuss and debate at length. I'm joined by three co-hosts on this uh, episode. Let me first introduce someone that needs no introduction to Australian boxing, Mr. Tasmania, Grant Tazzy Brown. Now, let's get the resume right there, Tazzy. We've got uh, boxer, trainer, manager, promoter. Is there anything that you haven't done? Not much. I think you got I've done a bit of acting too on Underbelly Three, but you got it pretty much all right there. Yeah, I do remember that actually. The uh, the Underbelly. I didn't didn't know that till just recently. But um, so there's throw much. actor in there as well. There. <laughs> Good stuff, Tazzy. All right, we next go on to uh, our next host, which is uh, well-renowned uh, boxing promoter, commentator, agent. Anything else in there? Promoter. Uh, so many. Is it Asian Promoter of the Year or WBC Promoter of the Year at some stage? The one and only Peter Maniatis. Welcome, Peter. No, great to be on the show, Lyndon. And what a great first show we have in store. Yeah, we'll explain all that in a second. But yeah, it's a really good one to, to get us started. And our third guest to round out our, uh, our, our uh, panel is uh, Mike Altamura, uh, agent, scout, uh, manager all around the world needs no introduction um, if you if you look into the world uh, boxing scene at the moment so welcome Mike I know you're on a little bit of hiatus there with what's going on at COVID but still plenty going on around the world of boxing yeah it's still been pretty active on this side and I've got to say Lyndon I give you a lot of respect you've managed to congregate two other individuals in Australian boxing who I actually admire and adore which is that's a near impossibility well, there you go. So we've uh, we're all, we've got it started on the right track anyway. So there's all our ugly mugs. Uh, now, what we're going to do for our first episode is, well, we're just going to jump straight in the deep end. There's, there's no other way around it. Um, this is one of the most highly controversial and risky things we could probably do for our first episode. It, it is to discuss, and I said before, debate and delve into the Aussie to, uh, all-time Aussie top 10. So I'm already a little bit nervous about this, guys, because I don't think we could probably pick a topic that's going to be more open to uh, some, let's just say, some colourful feedback from some of our, uh, our watchers out there. Um, I could probably say, for starters, look, it's four people's opinions, okay? It's not fact. We're not saying this is the way it is. It's just four boxing experts' opinions. I think we're experts. Um, and it's just our view on, on the way we sort of see the top 10 of Australian boxing. Now, Tazzy, I mean, it's easier said than done this. How hard was it to pick the top 10? So hard that I I um, cut and changed a lot towards the end of the list. Even made it harder on myself. So I personally gave myself a restriction. Remember me and Lyndon mentioned how we're not going to have Costa Zoo or Victor Chinyan or Sakio Bika, guys that weren't that didn't grow up in Australia, that maybe represented another country, I've actually made it that you have to be born in Australia, which for me rules out Lester Ellis, Barry Michaels, uh, Johnny Famishan, Rocky Mattioli, so many legends, but I've made it harder. So for my list, you've got to be born actually in Australia, not just came over here later, born. So it's a bit harder for me. I've restricted myself. Okay. I should have probably mentioned from off the bat too that – not only is it going to be a, a highly uh, controversial subject that we're actually discussing, but we've got a couple of caveats in there. And like you just said, Tazzy, we're probably by our, the caveat we're putting in is probably eliminated the one fight. It's probably one or two on everyone's list, and that's you know the one and only Costa Zoo. Um, I can already sort of picture people throwing their um, their, their cups at the at their screens. But look, this is the Australian boxing top ten now. You know. We all love Costa. He's been a legend of the sport. Um, you know, he's one of the the favourite fighters to ever come out or to fight in Australia. But it doesn't hide the fact that he is a Russian fighter, a Russian citizen who simply based his career in Australia. So we have to sort of draw the line now. A little bit different uh, with a couple of the others in there. It might be a Barry Michael, Lester Ellis, or a Rocky Mattioli. I probably sort of see it a little bit different myself, Tony, and, that, and what you've created on your list is totally fine. That's up to you. But I've, yeah. I've sort of included them because they were, uh, even though Alester or Barry were born in England, they started their, the, well, they came over here when they were very young. They started their boxing career here. They had their entire career here, and they're Australian fighters. So 
a little bit different to Costa, who, as I said, um, came over. He had his 300-odd fights or amateur or whatever it was. Mike, you might be able to... Same call. as Vic Darchinian. And Vic Darchinian. You know, we love Vic these guys, been... but, yeah, as I said, you know, they're fighters that were born somewhere else and come over here to base themselves for their career. So, Mike, what sort of... Uh, criteria did, did you put on it, I, I, or, or what? When you were putting your list together, what were some of the things that, that you sort of looked at to, to put it together? Context matters. Mm -hmm. I think that you've got to gauge fighters differently in eras where there was only one world champion, whereas fighters in eras that have captured one or four world championship bouts available, titles can be manipulated, rankings can be manipulated. I needed to look at it and put into context what ideally a fighter would have accomplished if they were in a different era. So mm -hmm. you'll see that reflected in my listings. I don't want to give away my top 10 just yet. Okay. But I think you'll see that. What, what I found interesting, so I'm already giving you two potential future podcasts, is I was, when I created this list, so many exceptionally talented fighters missed the grade. And in my own head, I was struggling even to structure my top, say, 11 to 20. Mm. I really think that, you know, throughout time, maybe even if we rolled through and did, you go the eight traditional boxing weight classes and we did the top 10 Australian fighters in each traditional weight class, I think that of all time, I think that would be interesting. Mm. And like you said about Kostya, Saki Obika, mm. uh, the great heavyweight Peter Jackson, Victor Chinyan, a number of them, to me, they were transplanted Australians. Mm. I think maybe for future, that'll be an interesting discussion point too of, you know, maybe a top 10 list of five fighters that emigrated to Australia and based their professional careers here. Yeah, it would, would be a good call, mate. It's, um, it's, and look, it's, it's, it was really hard to keep those out because I know, as I said, like everyone loves Costa, they love Sakia, they love Victor Chinyan. Um, you know, I didn't go as far as what, Tassie didn't just put a line through the ones that were had their career here, but that's that's fine, mate. Now, Pete, um, what sort of... I mean, Mike just went through his criteria. Is it a matter of talent or the most talented fighter, or is it a matter of the fighter that has achieved the most? Because let's face it, there's a lot of super talented fighters that never won a world title that would probably rank over ones that have actually won world titles. Look, it's hard to compare errors. It's no different to other sports, you know. It's just right now, boxing, that there is a lot of organisations and there are titles and interim titles and super champion and regular champion. Well, guess what? Right up to 1963, there was only one world champion mm -hmm. and that was the way it was. If you had to be the champion, you had to beat the man. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't get a shot. Even to be in the top 10 back then, Yep. You would have been a world champion today. Make no mistake about that. Mm. So how do you compare that as far as some Aussies as well that, that did really well around that period? Um, you know, I'm not going to mention names yet, but we'll go into it. But for me, it's not what titles you won. It's who you beat and how consistent were you during that period? Was it a flash in the pan? Were you good for that 12 months? Mm. Or did you have a stretch for five or six years? For example, Manny Pacquiao, I mean, he, he just, he's been going 25 years at the top. Mm. It, not five years, not 10, not 15, 25 years at the top. How do you judge that? Mm. That's like seven or eight different careers. Yeah. Well, they reckon that, um, I did read the other day, I saw somewhere that he, uh, I think the first half of his career, um, before he fought, I think Dill Hoyer in 2008, he had a Hall of Fame career before that. And then once he beat De La Horry went into phase two and has had another Hall of Fame career. Um, and who knows, it could even be a third Hall of Fame career, but just an amazing fighter. But um, but enough with uh, Manny, we all love him, but this is the Australian top... Long, team, so longevity. What, what longevity. I'm trying to say is longevity of a fighter for me means a lot yeah. and what you did in that period. Is it the amount of fights as well, Pete? Because, I mean, some of these fighters are on these lists have had a lot of fights and others that may be on the list have only had a fraction of the fights as well. So is it individual fights or is it... It depends. I mean, you know, the old fighters used to have, you know, sometimes you'd have the bum of the month club, they used to call it, where you just used to keep active and mm -hmm. flick a few wins on rather than just sit in the gym. So yeah. the old fighters sometimes used to fight 15, 20 times a year. It wasn't uncommon. Mm -hmm. But they had three or four major massive fights, but the rest were just activity fights. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it's hard to judge that one. 
how many it just depends who you fought comes out and gut obviously feel, I think I think the um, you know from what I can sort of th see here is the theme is is that you know it's got, all our lists are going to be very diverse and they're going to have different reasoning for it and that's why what we're going to do is go through our top ten uh, explain yeah. why you have them in there and I'm sure that when some of these fighters get read out there's probably going to be a few eyes uh, eyebrows raised and that's fine this is why we have the discussion we don't want four people that are going to roll out the same the same people so. Let's go through, let's have a chance to go off our top 10 and why. And then at the end of it, we can uh, face the sort of firing squad and um, and take some questions and try and justify our decision. So the way we're gonna work it is, I'm gonna go first and jump straight into the deep end. Tazzy, we'll go make you second. Pete, you're gonna be third. And the round us out will be Mike at the end. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so I'm going to jump, we talked about before jumping in the deep end. My first one is going to be absolutely, not not only jumping in the deep end, but at shark infested waters, because I know you, you guys are probably going to fall off your chairs, but just hear me out. So uh, with, no, with well, no further ado, let me uh, roll out my top 10, starting with, drum roll Tazzy. Here we go, my number 10 is... Jeff Horn. Now, I can see the look on your faces in there. Let me explain. Um, look, I'm probably one of the ones that have gone on the lines of, yes, there's been some fighters who have had uh, a lot more fights, uh, maybe a lot more world title fights, and, and um, we all know that maybe Jeff's last fight wasn't the most, um, you know, or the best fight of his career. Tim Zhu um, did really do a number on him, but I don't think that really was the real Jeff. And who knows, Tim might be part of this list in five years' time. I'm sure he will. But my whole reasoning behind Jeff comes down to one thing and one thing only, and that's beating Manny Pacquiao um, in 2017. It's as simple as that. I think that one performance alone is enough to put him in the top ten. Um, as I said, he had those two wars with Zarafa in between that. He lost his title to to Crawford in 2018 in Vegas, came back and beat uh, Anthony Mundine and had those two wars with Zarafa and then ultimately the uh, the fight with Tim Zhu. So I know this is going to be a really controversial one, but the fact that he, you said before, Pete, with uh, Manny Pacquiao, he's an absolute legend, icon, no matter how you want to describe it. And not only that is that after Jeff beat him, he actually he's, he's gone on and beat, I think it was Adrian Broner and Keith Thurman and uh, Matisse. I mean, they're all three great fighters and are former world champions. And he was obviously meant to fight uh, Spence as well, but that fell through. So I know he's probably not as talented as a lot of other fighters. I know he probably hasn't had as many title fights and that longevity that you talk about, Pete. But that one fight alone, beating Manny Pacquiao in the biggest fight ever to feature an Australian, I know that might be debatable, but to me, that is the biggest fight um, involving an Australian ever, and uh, he come up trumps. And it doesn't matter whether you think he won or he lost. The fact of the matter is, it was a close fight. A lot of people saying, you know, Pacquiao got ripped off. In my opinion, you don't get ripped off in close fights. It was a very, very close fight. It went Jeff's way. I wouldn't have argued if it went Manny's way, but it went Jeff's way. So that alone um, has, has made him in my top 10. So I'll let you shake that one off, boys. Let's go to number nine. And Taz, you like this one because he's a, a Tasmanian boy. Uh, Daniel Gill now won the IBF middleweight title against Sebastian Sylvester in uh, Germany in 2011. Uh, four world title defenses before he lost to Darren Barker in very controversial uh, circumstances in uh, America in 2013. Uh, after that, lost world title fights to Gennady Golovkin and Miguel Cotto before he lost after being beaten by uh, Reynold Quinlan. Um, again, with this one, I think you've got to mention, even though he had those four world title fights, the fact that he went to Germany and not only won the title, but then defended it in Germany as well and won decisions over there, we all know how hard it is to win in, uh, in Germany. Uh, I think the fact he went over there and, and did what he did, I think, um, you know, and the fact he then got in with Golovkin and Kodo after, I just think he's been a real great ambassador for for Australian boxing. He obviously lost his first title fight to, to Anthony Mundine, avenged that later on, beat some good other Aussie fighters in Jared Fletcher and that as well. So that he's my awesome. number nine. And, um, yeah, we can debate that a little bit further on. So move on to number eight. And uh, we all love this guy, uh, the hitman, Jeff Harding. 
Uh, Jeff Harding won the WBC light heavyweight title against Dennis Andrees in uh, Atlantic City, USA in 1989. Who can ever forget that fight? Uh, true Rocky uh, performance that was, way behind on points. And it's probably one of those, like the Jeff Horn thing, that fight alone is almost enough to get him in the, in the top 10 because it was such an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable performance. Unfortunately, lost the, the uh, title to Dennis Andrews later on uh, that year, in, uh, sorry, the following year in 1990, but then won the title for a second time against Dennis Andrews in the UK in 1991, had two more defences before losing to Mike McCallum and ultimately retire, retiring after that. But a um, uh, great fighter, again, probably a little bit like Jeff, uh, Jeff Horn, probably a little bit limited in his boxing ability, but geez, he got the, the absolute maximum out of, his, out of his ability that he could. And again, that performance against uh, Dennis Andrews for me, I'll, I'll never forget it. You know, I was 15 or 16 years of age at the time and it'll live with me forever for Jeff Harding. So we move on to number seven. And uh, Melbourne boy, Barry Boy Michael. So uh, leading up to uh, when he won the world title, which he won against Lester Ellis in uh, July 1985, uh, had some wins over some great other Aussie boxers, Jeff Malcolm, Frank Ropers, Graham Brook, uh, and his probably biggest international fight, Al Earthquake Carter. Had three defences before losing the title to the late and great Rocky Lockridge. He was stopped in the eighth round in uh, the UK. Um, so, look, we all love Barry, uh, great fighter um, and just a stalwart of Australian boxing for a long time. Such a tough guy, was avoided by a lot of good boxers, uh, international fighters at the time. I remember he was supposed to fight Ray Boom Boom Mancini at one stage, uh, didn't come off. But, um, yeah, just a, a true legend of Australian boxing is Barry Michael. Which we move on to a fellow Melbourneian and someone who will be linked to forever and a day, the one and only Master Blaster, Lester Ellis. Uh, the IBF Junior Lightweight Champion, 15-round uh, decision over one kill you, February 1985. One defence in a memorable fight against Rod Sequinan before losing it to Barry Michael, as I said before. Uh, two classic fights later on with Calvin Grove, uh, retired in 1986. Uh, had a lot of fights along the way, won a lot of um, titles, uh, obscure titles, I suppose you'd call them, but still was very active. Uh, had some good Australian fights, along with some of those international ones. Uh, come out of retirement in 2003, unfortunately, uh, fought Anthony Mundine, uh, stopped in three rounds, but I'll never hold that against him. I just remember this guy winning the um, world title, when I think when I was 11 or 12 years old, and just being a, a legend of Australian boxing, and I think... Uh, probably one of the most popular Australian fighters of all time. Who can ever forget those fights in uh, Festival Hall when the chant of Leicester went around the, uh, the stadium, just sent chills down the spine. So uh, very admired fighter is Lester Ellis. He's my number six. Uh, now we go into the top five, the juicy stuff. So my number five is Les Darcy. You can see their record of 46 and four, 29 KOs. Uh, what's unbelievable about this guy is that he died at just 21 years of age. He claimed the world middleweight title, but it was only recognised in Australia. I think back uh, back in the day, and I'm sure Mike will have a bit more information about this uh, later, but um, was recognised uh, in Australia, but not on the world scene. Um, he won that title over Jeff Smith with a disqualification in May 1915, all those years ago. Had nine defences of that that version of the middleweight title and even won the Australian heavyweight title and had three defences. So he went to America to chase the big time over there. Uh, a little bit like Farlap had the um, mysterious circumstances, but unfortunately never got that, that big fight over there. But Les Darcy, what an absolute legend that... Uh, that he was so a little bit hard too to judge um, to judge uh, judge Les Darcy because there's not a lot of footage of him on the net, uh, but his record, if you go through it, is quite um, substantial. So number five for me is Les Darcy. We then go to number four, and this is another guy I didn't know a hell of a lot about before doing some research. Dave Sands, 87 and 10, with one draw, 52 KO. So what a record for Dave Sands. And while I, as I said, while I knew a lot of Dave Sands, I probably never delved into him as much as I did for research for this, but one of six brothers, uh, his actual name was Richie, um, but was under the name Sands all the time. I'm sure, Mike, you can explain a little bit more again about this, or, or Pete. Uh, unfortunately, died in uh, 1952. He had 110 fights, as I said, 90, uh, sorry, 87, 10 and one, 52 KOs. 
two day contest, 15 knockouts in the first round. Um, and at the time of his death, held the Australian middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight title. So just a magnificent fighter. He was highly ranked in line to fight Sugar Ray Robinson uh, at one stage, but um, I think he was avoided there uh, for that. So, uh, but still a legend of Australian boxing. He's my number four. And now we go to the important stuff, number three. And this is a fighter, as we mentioned before, was actually born in France, but um, raised and fought his whole career in Australia, was Johnny Famishon. We love Famo, 56, 5 and 6 with 20 KOs. So WBC featherweight champion with a 15 round decision over Jose Legra in 1969. Two defenses before losing to uh, the great Mexican Vicente Saldivar in 1970. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, with a 15 round decision in Rome. Um, and then retired after losing that fight to Vicente so, uh, or Saldivar. So just a legend again of Australian boxing. I think his uh, resume speaks for itself. As I said, 56, five and six with, uh, with 20 KOs. We go to number two. This is where um, it gets uh, very interesting because it was really hard to split t these two guys. My number two, the um, uh, the legend that is Lionel Rose, 42 and 11, 12 KOs, won the WBA and WBC Bannerweight title against Fighting Harada in February 1968 with a 15 round decision. Defended it three times before losing to the legend Mexi uh, Mexican legend Ruben Olivares. Uh, lost the WBC Super Featherweight title shot a few years later against, my, um, against uh, Yoshiaki Nomata in 1971 had four years out the ring before losing four out of his last six. So don't let those 11 losses fool you. He lost a lot of those late in his career, uh, retired in 1976. So uh, Lionel Rose, which brings us to the number one fighter on my list. And I think this guy absolutely needs no introduction. It's the Marrickville Mauler, Jeff Fennick. Uh, 29, three and one, 21 KOs. And his resume is that long. It'll take me ages to get through it. But pretty much 1984 LA Olympian three-time world champion, and it should have been four times. Uh, the IBF probably had a little bit of asterisk beside it when he first won that uh, in 1985 against uh, Satoshi Shingaki, but those WBC world title fights that he won uh, later on um, against, excuse me, Samart Payakaroon and Victor Kalagis will just go down in history, beat Olympic gold medalist Stephen McQuarrie, former world champions, Daniel Zaragoza, Carlos Arade, Victor Kalegis, and Marcos Villasana, and Mario Martinez, as well as top ranked um, contenders, Jerome Coffey, George Navarro, and Tyrone Down. So, as I said, needs absolutely no introduction um, or his resume <laughs> spelled out, so I think we all know everything about Jeff, and uh, I think for me, the number one fighter um, of all time in Australia. So. There it is, my top 10, uh, it's just on screen at the moment. 10, Jeff Horn, 9, Daniel Gill, 8, Jeff Harding, 7, Barry Michael, 6, Lester Ellis, 5, Les Darcy, 4, Dave Sands, 3, Johnny Famishon, 2, Lionel Rose, 1, Jeff Fennick. So, there it is, boys. Let me have it. Tazzy? Um, yeah, well, your list, the later part of your list is quite similar to mine. Um, yeah. I won't say about that, but yeah, like, um, uh, look, mate, yeah, look, as I said, I, I can't have Lester, Barry, and, and, and mm. Famo. Well, I would have loved to, but I made that criteria. Um, mm. but I guess, look, Horn, great win over Pacquiao. Um, I don't have him, I don't agree with it, obviously, uh, but mm. I mean, look, great win over the great legend Pacquiao. Um, but I mean, you know, one win doesn't do it for me. It wouldn't matter who it was. It's like Green's win over Roy Jones Jr. It doesn't make him an all-time great. Even though Roy might have been past, so you can say he was past him, but he's gone on in one fight. So, yeah, um, I guess you knew you were going to get a bit of flack with that, that one. So, um, full respect to Jeff. Awesome fighter. Great guy. Great for boxing. But gave Australian boxing the boost back after the win over Pacquiao. So, fuck, what a great effort. And Tim mm. Zoo's rolled on from there. So... Um, Harding, obviously, yeah, great. Um, yeah, obviously, the Melbourne boys, obviously, you know, you guys are probably going to be a bit favouritism of Michaels, Ellis and Famo, which I can understand that. But, yeah, um, as I said, I'm just doing the only naturally born Aussies. But mm -hmm. not too bad, Linda, not too bad. Thanks, probably mate. only the Horn one's the only one I really don't agree with. Yeah, yeah, no, and I fully expected that. And I'm sure I'll get the same from Pete. What do you think, mate? 
No, no, I'm quite comfortable with it. Everyone's got a different opinion. And um, what Jeff Horn did that night, he beat Manny Pacquiao. I mean, he beat a legend and there's no reason why he shouldn't be there. If you think he should be there, I mean, and he's an Olympian, he mm-hmm. defended his title against Gary Corcoran. He, um, you know, he went to Vegas and fought now the best pound for pound fighter in the world as well. And he, he lasted nine rounds. Um, do you think he deserves fans. to be, you know, it, yeah. so it's everyone's opinion. That's, mm. That's your opinion. I fully respect it. Not many Aussie fans Jeff have um, headlined the MGM Grand Garden in a in a uh, massive fight, have they? So it's um it's the Rome. But um yeah, what else? Mate? Yeah, mm. that, yeah, that's why we're going to be here. We're going to you know have a bit of a pick at each other, and that's the whole point of the thing. You know what yeah. I mean? But hey, look, your list is a great list. Everyone is, is a champion on there, an Australian legend. Mm. Um and yeah, I mean you know great great list, yeah. All right. And Mike. Don't look at me like that. I can just see the way you're looking at me. I'm about no, I'm to cop it. it see, <laughs> Lester Alice is my favourite all-time fighter. Anyone mm. that knows me knows that. He's not on my top ten list, mm. despite that, because I think I think potentially Lester was better than everybody that we have listed mm. in the top yeah, ten. Yeah, agree. But you agree. Better, agree. You back up the resume based on the accomplishment, not on the potential accomplishment. Mm. And it's heartbreaking to have to leave Lester off because by virtue of that. Barry just missed the cut of my list too. Mm. But I would always think of those two as amongst at least the top 15 of Australia's greatest fighters. Mm. And, I think, and, and even yep. even Geely. Geely, yep. I think, fits somewhere in the top 11 to 20. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't sit there and argue with you that he could be in the top 10 because he won his world titles the hard way. He, tra- he travelled the globe, mm. won both Great. his world championships in Germany. Mm. Now... What would have cemented him in the top 10 for me is had he traveled to Germany and beat the world number one. Mm. He never beat the world number one at his weight yep. class, yep. you know, which was, which was Golovkin at the time. Mm. But he still beat, he beat the number two, he beat the number three. That's very, very solid. Mm. And I've got to give a, a, uh, an honorary mention to um, uh, a couple of guys. Uh, Anthony Mundine, I think, um, was great for me because he, in my mind, still didn't win... Yep the world title i know he won legitimate wba title but but as far as being what a value to australian boxing i thought he'd be almost you know top of the tree as far as the the eyeballs on australian boxing and also someone that probably hasn't or doesn't get a lot of kudos and that or a lot of respect and that's for me robbie peden um yeah he won the same world title that barry and lester won uh, also headlined the MGM Grand against Marcus uh, Tony Barrera, fought Marquez as well. So, you know, I've got a lot of respect for Robbie. Not just that, his amateur career on top of that, which we can do another time, the, the amateurs as well. So, but that's good, guys. Um, that's my Isn't top it? 10. Why did, yep. you have, why did you have Leicester ahead of Barry when Barry beat Leicester? I just thought that when they fought that Leicester was, I think, might have just turned 20 or not even 20. Um, I've got to say the management of Leicester had a lot to answer for for actually putting me in the ring with Barry Michael in the first place because um, Barry just had a habit of ruining these young boxers, didn't he? But um, I just think ability-wise and what he did after that, I just thought his whole sort of portfolio work later on. He sort of redeemed himself a little bit, Leicester. He, he fought regularly after that. He had those title fights. He, even though they were against obscure or for obscure belt, he was active. Um, as I said, he fought Calvin Grove a couple of times after he just knocked out Jeff Fennick. So I just think he just, overall, the portfolio for me was a little bit stronger for Leicester. I suppose maybe because Leicester was always my favourite fighter as well, Mike. So, um, so was, look, if you could have a tie... You know, but we don't want any ties in this. We want, you know, leg- um, you know, legitimate one to ten. And I just, my gut feel just says Leicester. All right, so enough of me. Uh, we move on to um, Tazzy. Um, so t- if you've got your organised there, mate, we'll do the drum roll for you and kick straight into it and go for number yep. ten, which is... Uh, was, it, was it Daniel... Um... Was it uh, Daniel Gill, was it? No, it wasn't, actually. It was this bloke. Jack, oh, Jack Carroll. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the legend. Jack Carroll, um, well, yeah, just an uh, absolute legend. 84 wins, only 10 losses. Mm. Um, he beat Billy Townsend from America, who became world champion. Um, he beat Americans Bilal Clavlin, 
Jimmy Leto and Izzy Janazo. And it was a known fact that Barney Ross, the current champion, um, was pretty much told not to fight him. Gus Levinovich went back to America and said, there's an old white man down there. He'll cut you to pieces. Keep your title in America. So a lot of the old fighters I'm going to mention here, you couldn't just go to America back then. Mm. Yep. We've lost your uh, audio there, mate. Yep. Yeah, we got you. Yeah, there, just have a phone call. Yeah. So if phone calls happen, we just cancel it, yeah, because it mucks it up. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, all good. So um so yeah, so look back then it wasn't that easy. I mean, um, you know, to to get shots, you know, America was a long way away, even though some fighters did come over, but it wasn't as big to go over there. So um Jack Carroll was just a great fighter, one of the legends of his era. Um yeah, it was a very, uh, I think he was pretty much campaigned at waterway at best, but he did fight a bit heavier at times. Um, and just a master. And I heard so much from my grandfather and father about him. And I truly believe that he would have been a world champion. And um, Barney Ross definitely was too smart to come to Australia and defend his title. So Jack Carroll, for me, is okay. um, in my top 10. All right, mate. Let me go to number nine. Daniel Gill, yeah. So I know Daniel is better than anyone. I was his state captain in the amateurs. Look, the fights he won in Australia, a lot of beating guys like Daniel Dawson on the way up. Um, losing to Anthony Mundine, I was at that fight, very close fight, but I thought Anthony just got it. But, I mean, it was touch and go. To then go on to Germany, first to go beat Sebastian Sylvester um, at IBF and then go back over and beat Felix Sturm, which was near impossible to get a decision against Sturm. As we all know, um, a lot of guys lost split decision terms. So he went over twice and won in Germany, which was at the time Aussies weren't getting decisions or anyone weren't getting decisions. So that in itself is amazing. Then he came back and Avenger lost to Anthony Mundine. Um, and then, yeah, look, probably unlucky to lose to Barker. Oh, that's the fight he shouldn't have lost. I think he, I think he um, almost had the fight one with the body shot, but. That's one night he probably shouldn't have lost to a guy like Darren Barker. No disrespect to Barker, but I think Gill, that's one fight that he probably should have um, that he let go. Um, and then, obviously, fighting greats like Golovkin and Cotto, um, even though he didn't win and didn't go the distance, but he was up in that, like you said, being a um, main event somewhere. He was main event at Madison Square Garden. Mm. So it doesn't yeah. get much bigger than that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, number eight. Anthony Mundine. I, I have Anthony and Daniel side by side. I think their career is sort of very different, but to me it was either one or the other. So Anthony, look, he brought Australian boxing back. It was dead. He brought it back. They come from rugby league without you know, a, an amateur career. To beat Aussies on the way up, like Rick Thornbury and Darren Obar, guys with heaps of fights, mm. To go over and fight Zvenoki, who had more total defences than he had fights, um, and was winning the fight till fatigue got to him. I mean, to come back and beat um, Anton Eccles, a great fighter, might have been only the interim, but later on, I think, was elevated to, to regular champion, which mm. these days, that's the way boxing is. Um, one of Mundine's best wins is over Sam Solomon. The second time they fought when he knocked out Sam, because no one does that to Sam Solomon, as you know, guys, what a great fighter Sam is. To stop Sam and to really dismantle him, Sam went on and become world champion after that, beating Sturm and fighting um, you know, legends like um, Jermaine Taylor. So to beat, to, beat, um, to beat Solomon convincingly out of the three, that second fight, to beat Danny Green at their best, I don't want to hear about weight, draining or anything. They signed the contract. They fought. I was there for 30, 40,000 people. Everyone tipped green. And Mundine put on a boxing lesson for the ages. Hmm. Um, so that's two very good opponents. The loss over the great Kessler to me was a victory. Kessler was the man. The super middleweight Viking warrior from Denmark. Mundine just could have done just that little bit more to win it. He did it, but he, no respect in losing there. 
Um, wins over Shane Mosley. Mosley come back and won a couple of fights after that. We can say he's over the hill. But we can say that about Roy Jones and Green as well. So, um, look, I think Anthony Mundine, for the wins he had and the win over Gill, because Gill should have beat Anthony. Gill had an amateur career. Gill was the middleweight champion, IBO. Anthony come down for super middleweight and had about, I think he's about 10 years older than, than Daniel. So Daniel's... Daniel Mundine won. Mundine done an amazing job to win that fight, and it was touch and go. Mm. The knockdown won it for him. He's in my top ten. Okay. All right, which moves up, uh, makes us move on to number seven. Hitman Hardy, um, two-time WC champion, uh, wins over David Vedder as well twice from America. Mm. Um, mate, just what a legend! The win over Andres is one of the greatest wins. In Australian sport in history, um, he beat Frenchman Christopher Tiozzo as well. Um, but to win the WC title, to win two out of three against Andres, um, Hitman, yeah, that's why he makes my top ten. Mm. Okay, yep. Uh, number six, Vic Patrick again, an old timer, uh, just a legend. The biggest fight. Him and Tommy Burns, they packed out the stadium in Sydney. Back then, thousands of people couldn't get tickets. They'll listen on the old radio. Vic Patrick was, um, yeah, 50 and four, and just an absolute. It wins over Tommy Burns, wins over Les Sloan, um, Americans Eddie Hudson, Tommy Stenhouse, Eddie That's Marcus, and. Um, this is Vic Patrick and. Eddie Miller. Uh, yeah. It was a Southpaw. That win over Tommy Burns was one of the greatest in Australian history. Yep. He didn't get his shot to America like Jack Carroll. You couldn't just go over there back then. It was very hard. Um, and the great Freddie Dawson was one of the greatest fighters ever, probably the greatest American ever come to Australia. He he beat Patrick after getting dropped by Patrick, and he even said after the fight, in, my, in Vic's prime, he would have beat me. And Freddie Dawson was avoided by... Ike Williams a lot. They fought. The Mafia had Ike Williams back then. The Mafia was big in boxing. As you know, guys, the, you know, the, the guys back then controlled New York boxing. If he went back by the Mafia, he didn't get a title shot like the Raging Bull. So, Big Patrick, in my opinion, in this day and age, would have been world champion and one of the greats of that era. Again, grew up listening about Big Patrick. Yep. No, and, that, and that vision we just had there was actually Vic Patrick and... Um... Right, uh, Tommy Burns, that one. So, which makes us uh, let's move on to number five. Jimmy Carruthers, our first official world champion. Um, young Griffo and Les Darcy, you know, won world titles, but America didn't, um, you know, look at those belts. So, Jimmy Carruthers is our only official, our first official. Think about Jimmy Carruthers, he was undefeated and retired for nearly 10 years. So, you got to remember that that um, he had a big layoff and come back and only lost his fights um, after the 10 years off or g give or take 10 years. But as we know, we beat Vic Tawil, stopped him in one round, yes, rematched him and beat him now, again. Yep. He was also an Olympian as well. And um, he beat Ellie Bennett, a great Aboriginal fighter, one of the hardest punches of all time, pound for pound, Ellie Bennett. So he beat Elliot Bennett. He beat Bluey Wilkins, who was another great Victorian fighter. He beat America's Johnny O'Brien. Um, yeah, just our first world champion, and I think he deserves to make it. And he only he only he retired from 54 to 61, and come back and lost then. So he was unbeaten if he retired. If he retires, he stays unbeaten as world champion. Okay. Uh, number four. Les Darcy, just like you mentioned, Lyndon, what a legend. We don't know a lot about him because he died young. But, I mean, he's a bit of Australian folk, folklore. Um, wins over George Ship, Buck Krause, um, Billy Townsend. He was um, yeah, just an absolute, an absolute legend, part of our history. I believe he would have won a war title um, at middleweight in this day and age, or, you know, if he would have been allowed to fight over there more and if he didn't die. But, I mean, he, um, he got that affected tooth, died young. 
Yeah, Hill is a middleweight title, our version, not accepted by America, but I think Les Darcy is one of our our legends of Australian boxing. Died too young. Certainly is, mate. Uh, and we go to number three. Dave Sands. Again, like you, Lyndon, what a legend, 87 and 10. Um, he beat Dick Turpin from England, great fighter. He beat world champion too, Bobo Olsen, who fought Ray Robertson many times. Um, it was said that he was meant to fight Ray Robertson. We all know Ray Robertson sometimes lose. He would lose once, Ray Robertson, but we'll get you in the rematch. So there's every chance that Dave Sands could have beat Ray Robertson if he got the opportunity. Um, he fought, he beat Henry Brim, Ivan Sten from America as well. Died way too young, I think 25, 26 years old. Um, you know, 110 fights. I mean, what, what a resume. And I think Dave Sands could have been world champion back then. Could have beat Ray Robertson at the time. I'm not saying he beats Ray Robertson nine out of ten times, but he could have beat him at that time. I think he actually fought on his undercard uh, on the, I think the Robinson Turpin undercard, and um, I think that was it the did. one that Turpin actually beat uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. So who knows if he had? Yeah, that was Randy. Could have been him. Correct. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. What a legend. Yep, certainly was, mate. Uh, and we go to number two. Lionel Rose, the first Aboriginal. World champion in any sport in Australia, any sport. Back then, there was only one champion. He went over and beat, I think it's still Australia's probably, you know, one of Australia's greatest sporting achievements. He went over and beat Fight Narada, two division champion, legend in Japan. He, um, he went over and changed history. So the first Aboriginal sports person to win a world title, not just boxing, in tough times. He defended the title in Japan. He also beat Chuchu Castillo, a great Mexican. There was a bit of controversy. The Mexicans went crazy in LA, I think, at the forum. But he did beat the great Castillo, who beat Olivares as well. Castillo mm. did, I think, one out of three fights. Then he lost to the great Olivares. The thing about Rose, I heard that he had trouble making band on weight. And they should have moved him up. But um, the great Jack Rennie... They didn't actually bring him up to featherweight quick enough. Back then, there was no super feather, super bantam, as you know, boys. You were one division. It was a big jump, bantam to featherweight. So he lost to the great... He beat Alan Rutkin from England, mm -hmm. but lost to the great, I think, probably greatest mix of all time. Um, but, yeah, Lionel Rose, you ain't got to say much more about the great Lionel. Certainly do, mate. Um, which goes, uh, well, brings us to the number one fighter of all time, which is... Yep, pretty much the same as you, Lyndon. Jeff Fennick, my old coach, um, mentor since 96. Um, look, as you said, the first one over Shingashi, the IBF probably wasn't one of the main belts then, but look what he'd done after that, beating um, Villa Villasana, Beating Steve McCroy, the gold medalist from America, got it, you know that Jeff would have won if that if he would have wouldn't have got ripped off at the Olympics. Mario Martinez, Carlos Arati, they say he was past his prime, but still he got the job done. Um, first fight for Zuma Nelson to be four time four division champion. We all know he won that fight. Um, you know so many Victor Clays and Villasana, great great Mexicans, great Puerto Ricans. Um, we know how bad his hands were. We can't explain what he told me, some personal things, how bad his hands really were. He'd break him in training. He'd fight. He'd get a cortisone ejection to go to the ring. He went through pain and hell. Jeff, that's why he pips on a rose as my number one Australian fighter of all time. Born Australian fighter of all time. Yep. All right. Well, that is your top 10 on the uh, screen at the moment, mate. You want to just a quick run through? Yep. So, obviously, Jeff Fennick, Lionel Rose, Dave Sandler, Darcy, Carruthers, Patrick, Hardy, Mundine, Gil, Jack Carroll. Now, I want to give some, how can you say, when you just give special mention to Young Griffo. Young Griffo had over 200 fights. Um, he fought the great Joe Gans many times, and Joe Gans is one of the great fighters of all time. Young Griffo, 229 fights. Um, 
I want to give special mention to Hector Thompson, mm-hmm. who fought the great Roberto Duran. I want to give mention to Tony Mundine Sr., who was one of the greatest we've ever had. He fought the great Monzon. Um, I want to give mentions to, obviously, um, Barry Michaels and Lester Ellis, two legends. Um, and Barry, I love Barry and Lester as blokes. Mm-hmm. Famo, again, legend as well. Um, and obviously, any you know, I mean, you know, Jeff Horn, great win over Pacquiao. Danny Green, obviously a great Australian mm. fighter too. Got the win over the great Roy Jones, which is probably the highlight of his career. Um, George Bracken, another great fighter, another great Aboriginal. And, um, yeah, I mean, a few special mentions. Just the guys that didn't make it, but were legends as well. Yeah. Mike, thoughts? Yeah, I think that quite a few of the guys Taz has mentioned are on my list, which, again, I'm not going to reveal all the nuances of yet, but it's interesting that a lot of what he's identified is the same thing that I see, just in terms of, say, with Vic Patrick and Jack Carroll, uh, putting into context that they were, because of World War II, they weren't in position to be able to travel throughout their careers because of what was going on internationally, whereas... Someone like Dave Sands, ill-fated, yes, but at least he had the opportunity to fight abroad. Actually, the the bulk of his last three years professionally was fought throughout Europe. So I think that, like I said earlier, context matters. I think, like, what all of this conversation, I'm looking forward to seeing Peter's list in a moment, what all this conversation stimulating is just how rich a boxing history we really do have in this yeah. country. Mm. Like, it's it's easy to forget how storied and how many gifted fighters we've had since the turn of the 19th century. Mm. Yeah, 100%, mate. 100%. What about you, Pete? Can I give a special mention oh. to Ron Richards as well? Yes. Ron Richards. Knocked down the great Archie Moore, lost to Archie Moore twice. Archie Moore, pound for pound, one of the greatest ever. Ron Richards, legend. Mm. Now, Tazzy's got a great list. I, I got... 60% of the list that Tassie's got on my own. So, um, look, everyone's got their debates on, on where, you know, the, most of it sits in the right place, whichever way. I'm sure all of us will have six or seven of the same top ten. Um, the others are just up to opinion. And, yeah, Tassie's done his homework. There's no doubt about that. Mm. All right. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, um... Yeah, I, look, I, I can't argue with your list at all, mate. I think it's what we discussed at the start about how you actually, you know, weigh up whether it's one fight or, you know, a whole fight or one achievement versus a, a whole career. So, no, it's uh, a great list, mate. All right. Pete, That's why I needed yeah. to cut. I needed yeah. to cut. Like, I needed to make the Australian born because Lester and Barry and Famo would have been in it as well. But I, yeah. I really wanted to give these guys a mention, like the Patricks and the Carols. And just can I say, guys, how honoured I am to be here with you three legends of Australian boxing. Peter Maniatis, who I went to your shows as a young man when I first came to Melbourne. Mate, you've just kept going and going and going and going and keeping Australian boxer going through thick and thin. They come and go, these promoters, but you've been there from fucking day one, mate. Credit to you, Peter. Oh, thanks, Toby. Mike thanks, Toby. Mike Atsumu, my brother, the most knowledgeable guy in the in in the world, manager of the stars. You are who you are. That's why you know Bob Arum. That's why you know, you know MTK. That's why they all know your name. You're a legend. Um, the way you can bring fighters along to get the best out of them. I've seen you personally. I've been involved with fighters like Luke Jackson, the world titles. To take a guy from yay to nay, you are the best manager in the world, mate. Very well said, mate. Thank you. And right. Lyndon Hoskins, mate, oh. 96 Atlanta Olympian, 93 Nationals, the first senior. Um, you know, you were just a beast, mate. You 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 stopped so many guys in Australia, in Oceania. Mate, um, you're one of the best amateurs. You don't get actually recognised enough. Mm-hmm. And you were absolutely just an absolute beast of a fighter, Lyndon. Would have been a great professional. Appreciate it, mate. Very much, very much so. And promoter as well. Of the oh, ran, in, ran into an opponent of Lyndon's as well. You, you did? The guy we spoke about. Remember, I showed you the photo. He was yes, with the league and he crossed did. over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, lots of good memories. And maybe we but can... I'm, um... I'm honoured, mate. I'm honoured to be here with you three legends. Well, I really appreciate it, mate. Yeah, appreciate it. 
All right. Well, uh, and look, it won't be the um, the only time, Tazzy. This is a, hopefully a weekly occurrence. We can, uh, you know, in one form or another, all get together. Um, all right, Peter, your turn to step up to the plate, mate. So the floor is yours. Um, we'll yep. start. We'll start at number ten, which is. Away, Ambrose Palmer mm -hmm. started, he held three Australian titles at the one time, middleweight, light, heavyweight and heavyweight. Also, didn't only contribute to the sport of boxing as a boxer, was a successful trainer. He was the amateur trainer in the 56 Olympics. He'd done so much for boxing. He, um, you know, he, back then it was just a completely different era. He also played AFL football of, for Footscray played over 80 games, got badly hurt in a football game, was never the type of person that threw his weight around on the football ground and pretended he was a tough guy. He was just a genuine tough guy. He trained Paul Ferrari at the start of Paul Ferrari's career. And Paul told me a story about Ambrose Palmer. Ambrose said to Paul, look, if you can't make it to any place, write a letter, put it in a taxi and get the taxi driver to drop it off to that person. That's if it's an emergency and you've broken your leg. He was that type of guy. So for mine... Ambrose goes in at 10. Okay. Number nine. The Master Blast, the Lester Ellis, that exciting period. I mean, he came in and won a world title at 20 years of age, I think he was, and um, defended against Rod Sequillen, a tough Filipino from the Alorde stable. And, um, you know, he just had every everyone buzzing in Australian boxing. Too bad that, you know, Barry Michael spoiled the party and Lester couldn't get that spark that we thought he was always going to have. But for mine, he still sneaks in at eight. At nine, sorry. Number nine. All right. Uh, which takes us to number eight. Barry Michael, the man that spoiled the party for Lester, also went on to make successful defences and, you know, had a great career, obviously lost to Rocky Lockridge right at the end, but that, that was no no disappointment. Rocky Lockridge was one of the, uh, you know, the real players back in that lightweight division back then. And for mine, Barry Michael earns his right at, at number eight. All right. Uh, yeah, a true legend, uh, Barry. Uh, number seven. Jeff Hardy, what can we say? I mean, a Rocky story. He had Donald Trump and Mike Tyson watching his fight the first time with Dennis Andreas. And I, don't, you, I think he only had 17 fights. And they were thinking, have we rushed it? Have we not? Dan on points comes out and pummels Andreas to win, uh, to win the title. And also, even his last fight against Gerald McCullough, a body snatcher, that was an awesome effort. And um, look, people say he didn't have many, you know, much he, finesse, but his jab was like a sledgehammer. For mine, he earns the right to be a two-time WBC world champion. He earns the right to come in at seven. Yep, 100%, mate. Number six. Jack Carroll. I mean, this guy, the legends that I've spoken to in the West, including Keith Ellis and Paul Ferrari, there's so many stories, but the, the, one of the main stories is Jack Carroll, when he retired, was a trainer as well, and he, he took a kid over to spa, a fighter that was coming in, um, to fight one of the main events. And the fighter was touching up his boxer that was a novice. And, and Jack was in his mid-50s. Jack said, stuff this, I'm putting the gloves on to get in there. And uh, Jack Carroll actually floored the guy that was fighting the main event back then, one of the imports at 55. So you can see what type of person Jack Carroll was. Yarraville boy, um, died in Yarraville, lived a long age. And um, just some of the old tough guys here, you just... You know, he should, probably could have been higher, Jack Carroll, but I've got him in at six. Okay, mate. So this takes us to number five. Dave Sands. I mean, this guy was smooth. He had all the skills. He, he had everything. He had close to 100 pro fights, died at 26. I think there was 14 people in on a truck that died, and he was the only that, that, that was on a truck during the accident. He was the only one that died. So it was pretty unfortunate for Dave Sands. Number one, a Robinson and um, was beating everyone at Robinson was beaten. So in today's current market, he, he would have been definitely uh, a world champion for a very long time as well and died at 26. So obviously we didn't get to see the best of him, but had a terrific career and comes in at five. That's... All right, number four. Les Dars, 
he turned professional at 15, was a featherweight. Um, you know, he was probably the Canelo Alvarez of today. He could have just taken things by storm. His career was stalled because he didn't want to go into the army for his own reasons, and they blocked him from fighting in Australia, so he had to go to America. And then the Australian government were writing letters to the American promoters. A lot of it was getting ignored, but he was lighting up the gyms in America during training and sparring. He was going to be a superstar. I mean, when you get a kid that fights 20 rounds as a teenager, because they were 20 round fights back then, and he had that skill, just some modern, you know, the old style Canelo Alvarez for me, and died at 21 with 50 pro fights under his belt. So uh, a living legend will always be remembered. 120,000 metered his coffin at the central station when it arrived and over 500,000 people have viewed his grave. So, um, you know, back then very close to Farlap as well, that, you know, we just didn't know what we had with Les Darcy. It was just a shame that that happened. Yep, uh, for sure, mate. Number three. Johnny Famish on Defensive Wizard, you know, uh, fought Harada, fought all the greats and, um, you know, there's not much you could say, but trained by the great Ambrose Palmer as well and, and was just was just an icon of the sport when the sport was really booming and, um, you know, deserves his place. He just went, went and did what he had to do and, you know, there was never many fighters as good as Famo defensively and um, definitely deserves his spot at number three for me. And was actually trained by the number 10 on your list, which is um, another... Family. Ambrose Palmer, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep, Ambrose great. Palmer. All right, mate, that brings us to number two. To Lionel Rose, what can you say? He travelled to Japan um, against all the odds to fight fighting Harada. It was, I think, 50 and 2 or 50 and 3 at the time. And, um, you know, just put in a masterful boxing performance, came back and was greeted by 200,000 people. And this was before social media, so you could see how big. The result was when you come back to Melbourne and there's 200,000 people lining during a parade to see you. And um, obviously went to America and defeated some great Mexican fighters as well. And um, just a true legend of the sport. I know his son, Michael, as well, who's a great guy. But Lionel at number two, you know, 53 pro fights, started as a teenager and, um, you know, really was, a, a, you know, on a one of true superstars of boxing. Certainly was, mate. All right, number one. No surprise, Jeff Fennick, I mean, won his first professional title, I think, in his seventh or eighth pro fight. Bruce McTavish was a referee, defeated Shingaki, and, um, you know, even his, his fight was, for mine, his fight on the undercard of Mike Tyson with uh, Azuma Nelson was declared a draw was one of the biggest rip-offs in boxing history. That would have given Jeff his fourth world title. And that's where he deserved to be because back then there wasn't many fighters that won four world titles in four different weight classes. Jeff has achieved that. He really won that fight. And the rematch with Azuma Nelson, we know it wasn't the Jeff Fennick that we know. And um, the, ref the rest of his career was fought with heartbreak because he didn't get that, you know, he got ripped off in there in Vegas. So if he had won that fourth world title, Jeff could have went on to maybe win five or six world titles. And, um, but still, you know, three world titles during the fourth world title and fought for a fifth world title a lightweight deserves the best Australian fighter of all time for mine. Yeah, no, I agree, mate. And, and especially with the fact that after um, he fought Azuma Nelson in Vegas, he was never the same. And I think all those that saw the, the rematch, uh, I, I know Nelson probably took him a lot more serious in the rematch, but that wasn't the Jeff Fennick that um, I think that we all knew. He never had that that pep in his step after that. And uh, I don't think we ever saw the best of Jeff again after that, which is a real shame because I think he was only 27 or something at the time. So... Uh, but no, uh, great list, mate. Um, really well mixed up there, and um, yeah, certainly no no contention from my end. What about you? Sure. Oh, sorry, mate. No, I was going to mention two guys. I, I was going to slip in was Vic Patrick. Obviously, yep. couldn't get him in there because I, Les is a good friend. So it's Barry, and I just wanted to put them in. Um, and also Paul Ferrari. Paul Ferrari was one of the most underestimated fighters of all time. He travelled to yeah, CB in '76. Defeated Rolando Navarretti. Navarretti was a WBC world champion. 
the the Manny Pacquiao back then of the Philippines. He uh, he got a pardon from President Marcos in Hawaii for rape. Went back to Manila, fought the number three in the world. He dropped him and uh, spat in his face when he was on the ground. And Bruce McTavish said, "I just couldn't disqualify him because the whole nation would have ripped me down as far, and, and Marcos as well." But Paul Ferrari travelled to Cebu, defeats Rolando never read in his fight up against Carlos Zorati when Zorati was knocking out every one takes Zorati 12 rounds. Richard, yeah. in his prime, Richard, Richard Steele stopped the fight on cuts. No, I didn't agree with that. And and for mine, Ferrari wasn't hurting that fight and was coming over the top. So Ferrari, a, a massive, massive, um, you know, he was a Commonwealth champion for 15 years back then when there was only two world titles. So. You know, in today's market, Correct. don't worry. Ferrari would have won multiple world titles. Yeah, you're right. Probably another fighter that probably doesn't get as much respect and credit that um, he was he was entitled to. But as Mike said before, an, an, another example of just how deep the Australian uh, heritage runs because, um, yeah, I must admit, I really didn't figure Paul Ferrari in there um, too much. But um, now you've brought that up, yeah, definitely um, one of the top Australian fighters of all time. So, uh, Tazzy, what are your thoughts, mate? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to give a special mention to Ferrari as well. He was a legend. He said before the great, um, you know, the Mexican Zorada in his prime. Um, yeah, mate, look great. This looks. See, you, you had the sort of the same thing as me. The reason I I didn't want to leave Barry Lester out too. Barry's a dear friend of mine. I love Barry, and I know Lester, and I respect him, and I, I love his um, you know, the the Ellis boys. But I mean, I knew I wouldn't be able to get Patrick and maybe. Um, you know, Patrick and um, and Carol in if I didn't, if I had like Fano, Ellis and Michael. So that's why I made the Australian born rule. So that's the only reason, Peter. Great list. Ambrose Palmer. Heard so much about him growing up from my grandfather. Legend. Fought the great young Stribling from America who was an absolute beast. Lost to young Stribling, but he was a great boxer. Trained Famo. Trained... Many boxers in Australia, how to box behind the left jab. Great. Great list, Peter. Can't fault you, mate. Pretty similar to mine. And Mike? I like it. I mean, uh, same with Ambrose Palmer. I'm happy that Pete gave him a shout-out. He just missed the cut on my list. But I think that there's, there's four fighters in Australian boxing history from the 1930s era that are widely overlooked. And... Two of them were on Peter's list. Ambrose Palmer's one, Jack Carroll's the other, and another two that are tied to him, Ron Richards and Fred Hennebury. Mm. All four of them were outstanding fighters. I think they're the kind of fighters that if they were around the last 25, 30 years, they would really be embraced by this country. Mm. So it's just great to see that the contributions of Ambrose haven't been forgotten. Good stuff. All right, Mike, With well, on that, um, you are now going to uh, step up. Uh, I can't wait to hear your analysis of all these uh, fighters. Let's start off with uh, number 10. Okay. Well, like you see, Vic Patrick. I think uh, you gentlemen explain a lot of why he's deserving of that spot. I think one of Australia's greatest pound-for-pound -pound punches ever. And it's, he wasn't wrecking journeyman. I mean, he wrecked another great Australian fighter in Eddie, Eddie Miller, you know, towards the back end of his career. He stopped Tommy Burns. Now, what you've got to look at is he was near unbeatable or, or pretty much within Australia anyways, was unbeatable at lightweight. If you look at he fought Tommy Burns, whatever it was, he gave away nine and a half, ten 10 pounds in that fight. And that was essentially the story of Vic's career. I've got no doubt that if he was capable of traveling, and able to secure a shot at the world championship, he would have given it a shake. And in an era where there's only one world title, the fact that he would have been a solid chance to have captured the world lightweight title, he deserves to be on the list. Yep, nice, mate. Number nine. Yeah, so gone with Jimmy Carruthers at number nine. Like you guys exemplified earlier, Australia's first ever universally recognised world champion. Now, you think about that and automatically you think that Carruthers should be higher on the list. And that's possibly so. The problem is he retired at 25 years of age. And really, outside of the victory over Ali Bennett, fellow Australian and great Indigenous fighter, 
again, one of our best pound for pound punches, who was world ranked at the time too. And then the two victories in South, in South Africa over Vic Tawil. First one, 200, uh, two minute 19, 110 punch demolition of Tawil. Returned to South Africa, stopped him in the later rounds. Hmm. Outside of those fights, there's not a real lot of depth to his resume. And that's why he falls in at nine. I could see the argument for him being higher on the list, but I just think that because he had the truncated career because of that that premature retirement and then the ill-fated return, I don't punish him for the return, but we just didn't see enough of him at the top of his game. Yeah. Yeah, I think he did, I think he lost four of his last five <coughs> or six fights, I think, didn't he? Mike actually retired undefeated and then came back and lost, I think. Is that right? Yeah, four, yeah. four of his last six, but... Mm. I perceive those the same way that we should perceive, say, Jeff Fenix lost mm. to Phil Holiday yep. for the for the IBF lightweight world title. You, you gauge fighters by their prime. Mm. Even you look at someone like Sugar Ray Robinson internationally, pretty much everyone recognizes he's the greatest fighter of all time. You're not mm. looking at the fact that the latter stage of his career, he was running at a 50-50 clip his mm. last 20 fights. I, I think that you gauge fighters by their prime, not by their indecision to retire with the right kind of timing. Yep, yep, no, agree, mate. Well, that brings us to number eight. Yeah, so this is an, another one that I could see why people would possibly argue that there's not enough substance to Harding's resume, given that, you know, 25 fights throughout his career. To me, what's telling is that even though on the way up he didn't have significant names, he dismantled fighters that had fought for world championships. So Australian Doug Sam... Emmanuel Otti, who was uh, African-based in Australia, he destroyed him. And that's why he was then given the opportunity to be fast-tracked, the late-notice opportunity against Dennis Andrews that we've seen. Yes, he lost to Andrews in the rematch, but come back, avenged it on points. What impressed me was he travels to France and destroys Christophe Tiotto in front of his own crowd. He was a travelling warrior. He, his career wasn't really coming back to Australia once he recaptured the world title, the WBC world title for the second time. And then even his final bout decision loss, a tight decision loss to the great Mike Callum, there's no shame in that. So I think that, you know, he's a solid guy, deserves to be there. Would have been great if we saw him against maybe some of the other top tier light heavyweights of the day, but it wasn't to be. Mm. Yep. I think it's, it's actually, uh, it's good that, all four of us have actually got uh, Jeff Harding in there. I must admit, when I put my list together, I wasn't quite sure whether he might fall under the Jeff Horn category, but um, it's interesting that I think he's the only, well, one of the only fighters that's actually been on all four of our, uh, our lists. So number seven, mate. Well, this is one that um, is a fighter that's just on your list, um, and he is... Rocky Mattioli. Yeah, I think, look, Tazzy gave his explanation of why he hasn't placed the fighters born internationally there. I think if you look in a consideration for fighters that one participated as amateurs and then turned professional under the Australian flag, you have to place Mattioli in your top 10. Even as like junior, junior middleweight world champion, yes, so based on that alone, but look even before he captured the world title, victory over Billy Backus, who was a unified world welterweight champion, beat the great Jose Napoli for the world title. So when you start looking at Matty Oli's resume, he's beat Bacchus, travelled, stopped Dugay, beat former world champions in Duran, Alicia Obed. He needs to be on the list. He was a terrific fighter, a two-fisted warrior. Probably forgotten because out of sight, out of mind. Uh, travelled back to mm. Italy post-career, was based there late, late fight career. So because of that fact, he probably gets a little bit overlooked historically, but what a great fighter he was. Mm, yeah, no, you're right about that, mate. He, mm. he, he probably doesn't get, an, an, again, enough recognition for what he did. So I think, and who did he, I think he lost to um, Maurice Hope, I think. For, Maurice Hope, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Vegas, I think that was too, from memory, in, at Caesars Palace. Yeah. So uh, on the big stage as well. So number six, a familiar name. Jack Carroll. Look, J Jack Carroll, if he received his opportunity, arguably could have gone down as maybe number one, number two of all time in Australia. He retired undefeated in his last 30 bouts. Now, when you look at the oh, resume of those last 30 mm -hmm. bouts, when you think about it, so 1934, Carroll, non-puncher, stops Wesley Rainey. 
eight, nine months early, uh, Ramey beat the reigning world lightweight champion in Tony Tanzaneri, who's one of the all-time greats. Then you look at, you know, three of his last six bouts, he beat Jimmy Leto. Jimmy Leto, post-fact, went on to beat Charlie Burley, one of the greatest African-American fighters of all time, never to win a world championship. Burley's resume was so respected and he was so revered that even as a non-world title holder, he was elected to the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Then you've got to also look, Carol beat Izzy Janasso, who was ranked number six in the world when he beat him. Carol, for two years straight at the close of his career, was ranked either number one or number two in the world and didn't receive his shot. It's not a guy that faded out. It's a guy that opted to step away, probably because of the war and everything else ongoing in the world at that time, and got out sharp and with his faculties intact. It's, it's a great resume. I almost feel bad not rating him higher, but it's tough not rating a guy higher when he was a world champion. Mm. Yeah, no, great insight, mate. Uh, number five. Yeah, so number five, I've gone with Dave Sands. I think that you gentlemen have perfectly outlined why he deserves to be this high on the list. I think that those two victories over Bobo Holtzen alone should see him regarded as one of the greatest Australians of all time. In fact, he was ducked by Sugar Ray Robinson. The other thing is most of his significant wins came internationally. And mm. to me, that deserves a lot of respect to go travel to the UK and I stick Turpin in around, that deserves respect. The fact that he only lost two bouts, one on cuts, after he was 18 years of age. So essentially the last eight years of his career, he was near unbeatable. I have no question he had all the capabilities to beat Sugar Ray Robinson. And Sugar Ray Robinson is, like I said, pretty much atop everyone's list of the greatest fighter of all time. So, mm. you know, Dave Sands, very, very deserved on the list. If not for what happened to him, the ill-fated accident, without question, he would have been higher. Yeah, for sure. All right, we're getting into the nitty-gritty now. Number four. Yeah, the Maitland wonder, Les Darcy. Again, you guys have gone into the detail of why he deserves to be this highly rated. I think that, you know, the wins over guys like Eddie Maguri, uh, Buck Krauss, some of the best fighters in the world. He's claimed to be a, a world champion at the time. So... If you look at it in context, yeah, it was disputed, but at 20 years of age, there was every possibility that with how great a fighter he was, he would have captured the universally recognized world title while in the United States. So again, almost eerily similar to Dave Sands, never received his opportunity, but completely deserved of his place in history. Yeah, 100%, mate. Uh, into the top three now. Yeah, so a lot of similarities to you gentlemen. Maybe a little bit of a different order, though. So number three, the great Johnny Famagen. You know, they used to say with Famo that if you, if you could hit him with a handful of rice, you'd done exceptionally well. And that's because of the beautiful defensive wizardry taught to him by the great coach Ambrose Palmer. You see with Famo that right hand always glued to his cheek unless throwing it. Left hand always extended, holding the guys at range, always keeping his shape and... Being able to maintain this for 15 rounds. Famo's another one. No losses after 20 years of age until he dropped the world title in a close fight to Saldiva, decides to retire prematurely. But again, you look at his resume, and this is what matters to me. Jose Legra beats the great Cuban Jose Legra, beats him in the United Kingdom on the road. Controversial draw with Harada in Australia. Many people believe that Harada deserved the nod. Um, Goes to Tokyo. Goes to Tokyo and demolishes Harada. Goes on the front foot, absorbs for 12 rounds, and then opens his hands up and stops Harada the final two rounds. To me, that matters. I, I should actually correct myself. So the first Harada fight was ruled a draw, and then they, dis they discovered a scorecard error, and it actually tipped at Famo's way. But most people felt that Famo didn't deserve the decision there. But... How he rectified, he travelled to Tokyo, went to the man's backyard and avenged it. I think that Johnny's place in history is solid. You know, there was always the talk of him fighting Lionel Rose in an Australian super mm. fight. What a fight that would have been. Unfortunately, it never happened. Yeah, yeah, it would have been another uh, Lester and Barry situation or Mundine Green situation, I gather, but it was not meant to be. Now, we move into the top two. Very interesting, these top two. Let's go to um, your number two, which is... 
the great Jeff Bennett. Oh. Oh. But I'll, I'll explain this. So you've all had your turn. I think, <laughs> I think Benny, if you look at, I always assess fighters' resumes by what the guys they've defeated have accomplished post fact. Jeff defeated three future world champions, Daniel Zaragoza, Greg Defle, Richardson, and Marcos Villasana. In the case of someone like Zaragoza, Zaragoza was a world champion 11 years after Jeff beat him. Mm. Greg Richardson, who Jeff completely destroyed, took his soul, was a world champion six, seven years later. That matters to me. I think that people, I hear it sometimes in our sport where people say that, you know, Jeff's career... His pathway to world titles was manufactured. Like you guys said, maybe the IBF world title, but Jeff earned his stripes every single step of the way. And it's a shame that he was deprived that fourth world title. If he, if he gets a decision against Nelson, maybe he's number one on this list because of what else he would have accomplished post back. The other thing is to keep in mind too, Jeff Fennig, the only Australian ever to be ranked in the top three of Ring Magazine's pound-for-pound world rankings. Mm. And I think that that's significant as well. However, I still haven't rated him number one. And I know you guys are going to slander me for it, but I'll, I'll explain when we get there now. All right, here we go, mate. Number one. Drum roll. <laughs> Can't be anyone else but the great Lionel Rose. And I'll explain to you, look, you guys have already delved into why Lionel deserves to be top two historically. I'll delve into why I think he belongs at number one, and then we can discuss it thereafter. Fighting Harada goes down as the greatest Japanese fighter of all time. That's indisputable to this day. He was a two-division world champion, and this kid, at 19 years of age, travelled to Tokyo and boxed his ears off clean. I think you can't underestimate that accomplishment. That's one of the greatest Australian sporting achievements of all time, any sport, period. It's a phenomenal accomplishment by Lionel. Then, to back that up, he returns to Tokyo, wins a 15-round decision over the undefeated Takao Sakurai, 1964 Olympic gold medalist. Sakurai was groomed to be the next world champion to pick up where Harada left off. But guess what? Lionel Rose destroyed that. Yeah, maybe the Chuchu Castillo fight was somewhat controversial. Doesn't matter. Historically, Lionel got the decision. Chucho, Chucho's a future world champion. Also accounted for Alan Rudkin, who, if you look at your top 10, top 15 bantamweights of the 1960s, Alan Rudkin is right there, one of the top fighters out of Europe. If that's not enough for you, so if you, if you want a little bit more, right? So 10th, 10th of October, 1970, Lionel Rose comfortably outboxes Gus Ishimatsu. A couple of years later, Gus Ishimatsu wins the WBC lightweight world title. Again, you can't underestimate. This is supposedly when Lionel shot. Everyone's saying that Lionel's over the hill by this point. So supposedly over the hill, Lionel Rose beat a future lightweight world champion. The recognized lightweight world champion who beat Gato Gonzalez, the great Gato Gonzalez for the world title. Lionel, by the thinnest of margins, lost to Numata in his last great night of boxing, lost to Numata for the 130 pound WBC world title. Lionel gets that decision. Undoubtedly, everyone universally will probably have him as their number one Australian of all time. That's why I make the argument for Lionel, because I thought his prime and his peak performances were that great. It's not to discredit Jeff, who, you know, Jeff is one of the greatest fighters of all time, period. You know, and what he accomplished should never be discredited. I just think that when you look at the resume of Lionel Rose, so many people gauge him by the Olivares title, by the end of his career. But if you look at his great nights, he had some spectacular nights. Well, there's the uh, top 10, Mike. Um, you run them down there. Yep. So number one, sorry, boys, but Lionel Rose. Two, Jeff Benick. Three, Johnny Thermajon. Four, Les Darcy. Five, Dave Sands. Six, Jack Carroll. Seven, Rocky Marioli. Eight, Jeff Harding. Nine, Jimmy Carruthers. And ten, Vic Patrick. Well, mate, all I'm, I'm going to say is I knew you were on this um, channel for a reason because um, that analysis of all of it just blew me away. So um, thank you for being on because um, very, very, insight, very, very insightful. However, <laughs> <laughs> mate, look, I... I I just can't get my head around um, the Lionel Rose ahead of Jeff Fennick, and I re re truly respect your opinion, but I just think that Jeff, you know, the, the, take the, w, the IBF 
actually title out of it. I think the fact that um, he, sh he should have beat Azuma and Alison, I don't care what the judges said. He's a three-time world champion. I just think his body of work and the amount of world champions that he beat, and he was top um, 10 pound for pound for, what, five or six years. I just think, Jeff, for me, he's undisputed number one, but you, you do make a great a great argument. What do you reckon, Tazzy? Oh, I want to thank Mike for putting Lionel there because on one of our cards, Lionel deserves to be there. Like... Mm. If yeah, like there's four of us here, and I'm happy to hear Lionel is at least on one because mm. he does deserve it. I mean, I yeah. had Fennec, Peter, Linda, but look, that, it was that slimmer margin, and I'm actually happy that Mike's done it for me. You know, put Lionel there because he deserves it. I mean, I think Jeff, when we break it down, the nitty gritty, but mate, Lionel, there's an argument there, and I'm happy that Mike's done that. So that's that's awesome because he, you know, like he said, he beat guys. That later on become lightweight champion. I believe he was held down too light to fit, put the ban away for too long. Mm. And who he lost to. Now let's talk about um, Ruben Olivares. Look, it's Chavez or Olivares who's the greatest Mexican right now. Mm. Oh, either one. So he, Olivares was that good. And Castillo beat, Choo Choo beat him. I think one out of the three times they had war. So Lionel deserves to get that mention. Um, the rest of the list, I think we've pretty much got Sam. We've yeah. all got Sands, haven't we? Carol? Les Darcy. Who have we got? We've mm. all got Sands, Carol. I was yes. I was just going to mention one name that just flashes to my mind. And he had his moment, but the moment left him. But it was just a build-up of losing his brother before the fight. And Michael Katsidis mm. fighting the great... Juan Manuel Marquez, who is considered as arguably the best Mexican fighter of all time, and ice Manny Pacquiao for five minutes. Yep. So we're talking about a goal with pedigree, and Katsidis had him on the ground and nearly had him out. Mm. And he had that blink of moment where we all thought, is this going to be the biggest upset we can imagine? And if that was the upset, we would have been talking about Katsidis in the top 10. There's no doubt about that, but it didn't go his way. But it just flickered through my mind, and I wouldn't put him in my top 10. But I thought I'd just mention it. Yeah. Good, good mention, Pete. While you're there, mm -hmm. can I mention Troy Walters, boys? Yeah. Troy yeah, Walters. Terry Norris. Well he had his moment with at Terry Norris. Time, yeah. He had Terry Norris at the time was a bad, bad man. And he had T Norris gone. He, um, he, you know, he, he fought Simon Brown as well. Simon Brown, yeah. He, he beat, a, yeah. Um, I think he beat an Olympian gold medalist as well at one stage as a pro. Troy Waters was a great fighter. I think mm. the best probably light middleweight I've ever had. I think he probably beats Manioli mm. if we put him era versus era. Um, Troy Waters, a bloody great fighter. That's all mm. I can say. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, what I've done, guys, um, I've actually put together a bit of a ranking system based on all of our our lists, um, giving 10 points for number one, nine for two, and so on and so on. And this is what we've come up with. Okay, now it's neither here nor there, but you can see the rankings there. Jeff Fennick, number one. Lionel Rose, number two. Dave Sands, Les Darcy, tied uh, for third. Johnny Famishon, Jeff Harding, Vic Patrick, Jack Carroll, Jimmy Carruthers, Lester Allison, Barry Michael. And obviously it goes down to the ones that only got one or, or two votes. So, but just a... Uh, a fascinating discussion guys and um, really privileged to actually hear your thoughts because I must admit I probably didn't delve as much into the, a few of those old fighters as maybe as I should have probably been more the the generation that I actually know from probably the 50s onwards I suppose um, but really that's correct that's correct Lyndon we can tell you can tell your list mate yeah. <laughs> Keeping a very rich too far back. Fred Hannabry as well. Fred Hannabry as well. Mike mentioned him and I want to mention him as well. He, he yeah. the people I've spoken to had an amazing career. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hey boys, you wanna just do a quick little thing like quiz? Why don't we just quickly mention like what Aussies fought legends? Like we know Horn for Pacquiao, but and Crawford. what are like Man, Man, um, Tony Mundine and um, Monzon, Unlucky, Hector yeah. Thompson, Duran, <laughs> even Green versus Roy Jones. I mean, there's been some good Aussies. Fight, and Archie Moore versus Ron Richards from Australia, Ron Richards. Mm. So there's been some good fighters that fight actual legends of the sport, you know what I mean? 
Mm. Glenn yeah, Kelly for Roy Jones Jr. Glenn yeah. Kelly, the correct, famous chicken, correct, Peter. chicken hook, and you know, the there's Hussain a lot of Port Manny Pacquiao. Yeah, yeah. The and uh, yeah, and also Paul Ferrari. We mentioned fighting Carlos Zarate. Zarate. At his peak, yeah. So I think. Yeah, there's about, a. Sorry, Pat. Mike, go ahead, mate. Barnes beating Wallace Bud Smith, the future light world, lightweight world champion, twice. George Barnes was a great fighter, yeah. Oh, boys, can I also mention Shannon Taylor, the mm -hmm. master blaster? Same Mosley, yep. The bull-eye blaster. Mm -hmm. What a great fighter, Shannon, in his prime. Yeah. Jeez, we could be here all night going through the Aussie fires because it's not till you actually try and do your list. I encourage people out there that are watching this to try and Shannon do it. Shannon Taylor, bloody, bloody oath, at his mm -hmm. best when he knocked out Willie Wise mm -hmm. on Bill Morty's, Bill Morty's fight night. Um, Fort Mosley um, beat... Yeah, Buck Smith, he beat some good Americans. He was a great fighter, Shannon, and mm. a tough guy. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, nah, for sure. All right, guys, final word. Tazzy? Well, oh, yeah, final any... word. Look, great list. Also, the Hussein brothers, Adele and Hussey, um, you know, naturally born Australians as well. If they would have won one of those world titles they fought in, if, Pac if the skinny would have got the win over Pacquiao, which was unlucky in the Philippines, I would have probably put him in there. But um, and Hussey great against list guys Arce. Same... Sorry, Lyndon. And Hussey against Arce, Jorge Arce. Yep, yep. Yep. Great fight, the first mm -hmm. one. Just the just the depth of Australian boxing. You guys have just shown me, which I didn't, I, I expected it from you guys because she's a historians like myself. You know, the legends like the Carols, the Patricks, the Sands and the Darcy's like, a lot of the young people in boxing don't know this. Mm. And some of these talk shows on Instagram wouldn't have a clue who we're talking about tonight. Mm. So awesome job, boys. Um, these are all bloody boxing, um, just historians. Good stuff. And uh, if Mike? I could, if I could say something, Lyndon, I think a lot of people watching this too won't know because the way this gentleman carries himself. But the guy in that top square with a little bit of a mo was one of one of the baddest, most hardest men that I seen enter a boxing ring in the mid nineties. And that's you, Lyndon. Like I know you you don't particularly enjoy or maybe it's a humility in you. You don't talk so much about what you accomplished as a fighter. But you know, like Tazzy said, nineteen ninety six Olympian. And if only if I was if I was twenty two years of age and not twelve years of age, I probably would have come chasing you with a contract to be a professional <laughs> because you would have been a terrific pro and had a great career. And, you know, it's great to see you still involved in the sport. No, I really appreciate and it. And Lyndon's mate. brother as well. Lyndon, you had your brother. He was very yeah. talented as well. I remember you guys in the Calabria Club. There was a guy called Moody too. It used to fight with the Brizzies, a southpaw. Ross Moody, yeah. Do you remember that? Ross, Ross Moody. Ross Moody. Yeah, Ross Moody. yeah. 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 he was in my division of the Nationals. Good fighter. He was. Yeah, well, good fighter. Well, and Shane Carpenter. Sorry, to cut, sorry, mate. I was just going to say, I was, um, thanks again for those kind words, guys. Very much appreciated. Well, let's let's um, see if we do, can do a uh, top ten amateur uh, Australian all, all time top ten. That would be uh, fascinating as well. So, because we've had a lot of great amateurs uh, along the way, and uh, we can maybe add it to the list. But what we we want to do is add um, you know, more of these rankings. Maybe we can do a pound for pound all time top ten, which would be which would be a lot of fun as well. Uh, some dream fights, maybe some re revisit some some uh, famous fights from the past. But you know, that's the reason why it's called Deep Dive is that we can pick any topic uh, or subject and delve into it as much as we can and have a bit of fun with it and hopefully uh, get a bit of feedback and some input and interaction from uh, some, some live streams that we might be able to do as well. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart guys for being involved it will not be the only one I, I want to do it on a very regular basis and have you guys um, on as much as possible where time permits uh, i think we've all got a bit of time in our hands at the moment with the COVID situation but um so hopefully we can get a few away but thanks again guys really appreciate it and uh until next time this is boxing deep dive thanks Linda. Well, that was our first episode of Boxing Deep Dive. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of your own opinions out there that we'll hear all about. But look out for next week when we uh, dive even deeper 
into the worldwide pound for pound top 10 of all time. So plenty to discuss there. So thanks again for joining us and uh, hopefully we can see you next week. Thank you.